welcome you all to worship with us today. Maybe there are some of us who have not worshipped with us before. But we extend to you a warm Christian welcome and our prayer that God would have brought you to hear the word today. Uh, we welcome today uh, Mr. Mark Bew. Uh, we are glad to have him with us today. He served faithfully at that task for a number of years. Uh, he and I know each other <coughs> from when I was a, a member of the uh, Interchurch Relations Committee of the PCA. And um, uh, PCA and OPC actually sit down together and talk to each other. And, uh, and we certainly did that at different places that we had over the years. So we welcome him warmly uh, to our congregation today. Let's please just compose our minds. We will hear the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. mercy and peace to you from the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Would you please stand? Our call to worship is from Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as at the day of Massa in the wilderness. Let us not harden our hearts, but hear God's word and sing to his praise from hymn number 13 in the Trinity of Noah. Upon our hearts as we hear the word of God 
And may we, as we hear these things, have cause to praise and glorify your name for all that you have done in our lives and our hearts. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. We come to the reading of the law. As we read this, uh, it's very easy to think that uh, the only reference made is to that of uh, illicit sexual relations. But that isn't the only reference in the scriptures. You will find that the children of Israel are accused of adultery because they worship false gods. And it's something for us to bear in mind. It's very easy for us to say, well, it's simply that matter. Obviously, it affects the way we think in that regard to those things. But the important thing to remember is that whenever we worship false gods, we also sin against the Lord who made us. Let us hear the reading of the law. You shall not commit adultery. Please be seated. Let us come to prayer and to confess our sins. Heavenly Father, we come to you because you are our Father, and you alone can grant us forgiveness and the assurance of peace. We are sinners. We sin in so many ways, the sins of our tongues, the sins of our minds, and very often the very sins of our heart, as we delight in things we ought not to delight in. We pray this morning that you would forgive us for all our sins. We are thankful that the Lord Jesus Christ died to take our sin from us. That he died there and it was our sin, the very essence of our being. It was for that he died. To take away that which Satan had placed in upon us and caused us to follow after it. And all the sins that flowed from that. Beloved God, Come near to us and present to us this morning the blessedness of the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us and who took away our sin and forgives us for the sins that we commit. Bless us now, O Lord our God, and be merciful to us. For we ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us hear the scripture assurance of pardon. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in repentance and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and trust shall be your strength. Let us sing a hymn of thanksgiving, hymn number two in the Trinity hymnal, O worship the King, all glorious above.
Pictures, and this is the choice of uh, Mr. Bew. He wants us to read from John chapter 17, which is Christ's High Priestly Prayer. And the issue that is before us in this section is really the unity of the church because of the unity that exists within the Trinity. And because uh, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are at one, so he, as the Church of God, must be at one both locally, we must enjoy unity. And wider uh, in our denomination, churches that belong to us, and certainly with all God-fearing people everywhere. Let us hear the reading of God's Word. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their work, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, just that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory, that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. And thus far in the reading of God's word. Creator God of the heavens and of the earth. 
Every planet in the furthest stretches of the universe is your creation and it would bear the marks of divine fall. And so it is for us on earth that your hand has created it and we see the marks of divinity upon it. We thank you, O Lord, for the providence that orders the events of this world. And whilst that providence is sometimes painful, we nonetheless recognize it is as you have decreed. Sometimes, Lord, it is for judgment. Sometimes it is for instruction. Sometimes it is for blessing. And so we pray, O Lord our God, that this very day we might see the world in which we live as the evidence of your constant involvement in the way we live. We think this morning, Lord, of the, of the terrible events in Paris over the weekend. It was your hand that permitted that, ordered it, and allowed it. And whilst we might say with uh, quaking hearts, how can we say that? We say it because God has given us commission to beseech himself for the souls of men and women who live in darkness. We pray, Lord, for the people of France, a country that has long since left the kingdom as something that is of no value. And we beseech you to bring again a revival of religion in that land. It's the land of Calvin, the land of many of the martyrs. And now, Lord, we pray that it might be the land which would give us direction and hope in the midst of these dark times. We pray, O oh Lord, our God, that you would be with those that we have mentioned. We thank God for every family that is affected by illness and sickness and long-term needs. And we ask you to stretch out your hand and care for them this morning. We know a lot of families who are worried, who are perturbed, and we ask that you would quench those fears and that you would deal with the one who has fears in our heart, that we might have comfort and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, O oh Lord our God, for all those who are bearing burdens, caring and loving, we ask that you would be with them. We pray for our families. Pray, Lord, that uh, the things that so easily can divert their attention from godliness, the pressures of this world, uh, the pressures of the internet, the things that they see in and sometimes indulge in, that they might see them for what they are, empty, foolish, and giving no peace. And we ask, O oh Lord, our God, that you would strengthen our minds and our hearts with the great power of heaven. We pray now, Lord, for the ministry of your word. We thank you for the work of mission uh, that the OPC is involved in. When we think of our missionaries, think of those in, 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 uh, in Eritrea, those in, uh, in uh, Uganda, and those in uh, Ukraine, and in China. Lord, we think of all of them and pray that you would bless them that you would encourage them with souls won from darkness into light, and that it might be their testimony that both our praying and our giving was a means of encouraging them in the work that they do. As the holiday season comes, Lord, many of them will be far from their families, so we ask that you would bless them, and that you would encourage them with the great gifts of heaven, and we think this morning of, uh, of Dan Knox and his wife and little boy as they prepare to return to this country and that he faces uh, uh, interviews with uh, uh, doctors and with surgeries that uh, might, might uh, allow him to exercise his gifts in this country. We pray for him and for his family and for his dear father and mother too 
and ask that you would guard, guard them and keep them. Bless us now then, we pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us. And may our hearts be strangely warmed to quote one of your saints as we hear the scriptures open in our hearing. Be with us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let us come to sing the hymn of preparation in 486. God, be merciful to me. Our scripture text this morning is near the end of a very familiar story for us, the story of Joseph. It will begin reading in Genesis 44, beginning at verse 14. But before we read it, since we're coming in at the end of the story, let's get up to speed, okay? 
It starts way back with the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob is a twin. And Jacob will, tr will trick, will cheat his twin brother out of both his birthright and his final blessing. And his brother will hate him, and upon the news of his father's impending death, actually plans to kill his brother. And so Jacob flees. And God doesn't forget him. He ends up bringing him to the house of a relative. And along the way, he spots a beautiful girl, and he falls in love, Rachel. And he goes to her father and says, what's the bride price? What must I do that I might have her as my wife? And he says, work for me for seven years, and you can have Rachel as your wife. And scripture says, the years flew by, so great was his love for Rachel. And then came the wedding, and the wedding night, and the next morning, and the trickster had been tricked. It wasn't Rachel he ended up married to. It was her older sister, Leah. What to do? Well, you tricked me. I still want Rachel. What do I have to do to get Rachel? Seven more years. Finish the wedding week, and you can have Rachel on your promise for seven more years. And so he does that. So he's got two wives, a loved one, and an unloved one. And God hears the prayers of the unloved one, and he gives her four sons. Rachel, the loved one, gets desperate. She says, well, if I can't have children, take my, con my handmaiden as a concubine that you might have sons by her in my name. Two more sons. Leah says, well, let me get into that too. Take my handmaiden also as a concubine. Two more sons. Still no sons for Rachel. God hears Leah's prayers again, gives her two more sons. We're up to ten sons. And finally, God hears Rachel's prayer and gives her a son, Joseph, who is the central character in the scripture we're about to read. Favorite son of favorite wife. And then some more years will go by, and then finally, Rachel will die in childbirth, giving birth to Benjamin, the last and the twelfth son. Jacob's not really very wise in this. He's got, what, two wives, two concubines, 12 sons, and he decides to show favoritism. Favorite son of favorite wife gets the coat of many colors. The other sons have to go out in the field where it's hot and dry and nasty and take care of the animals. Joseph gets to stay back in the tents where life is pretty plush. We're first introduced to Joseph when he's 17 years old, when one day his father says, go out and see how your brothers are doing. And he brings back a bad report. And scripture says they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. He has dreams. And in these dreams, they all end up pointing to the day that one, idea that one day his father, mother, and brothers will all bow down to him. And he tells them these dreams and they hate him even the more. Well, another time... Jacob sends his son out to see how the brothers are doing. And they see him coming in the distance, and they actually get together, and they plan his murder. And the Reuben, the oldest one, will step in and say, well, throw him into this cistern. Maybe he planned to go back and rescue him secretly later on. But they throw him into the cistern. And then Judah is the one who comes up with the final solution. He looks up, he sees the caravan of Ishmaelites on their way down to Egypt and said, ah, let's sell him in slavery to the Ishmaelites Slaves don't live very long, and at least his blood won't be on our hands. And that's what they do. They haul him out of the pit. They sell him off to slavery. We're told later in Scripture, he, Jacob, Joseph pleaded with them not to do so. They hardened their hearts, and he was gone. But God didn't forget him. He gets down into Egypt. He ends up in God's providence being sold to the captain of Pharaoh's bodyguard, a man by the name of Potiphar. And the Lord prospered him in his labors. He grew to, grew to positions of responsibility in the house. He had charge over all things. He must have been a handsome guy as well because Potiphar's eye, wife put eyes on him and suggested they do things that one cannot do righteously. But one time they were in the house alone together. She approached him. He fled. And then she accused him of a terrible, terrible crime. So bad, he's thrown immediately into the dungeon. And later on, hundreds of years later, when the psalmist will recount the history of all of Israel, looking at those mileposts, he'll talk about the time Joseph is in the dungeon. They put his feet in stocks, and they put his neck in an iron collar. 
And there he sat rotting for years. You can imagine what went through his heart. You know, like the prophet Jeremiah crying out from prison, Oh, Lord, why is it that the wicked prosper? When is there going to be judgment? But God doesn't forget him. He again causes Joseph to prosper even in prison. He has a couple of fellow prisoners, and one night they have dreams. Joseph gives the glory to God, and as God provides the interpretation, he tells his fellow prisoners, and indeed, this is what happened. The baker was hanged, and the cupbearer was returned back to his position of responsibility. And again, on the way out of prison, Joseph pleads, don't forget me. But you know the story. The cupbearer forgot him, and two more years went by until finally Pharaoh himself has a dream. And the cupbearer goes, oh, there was this Hebrew guy in prison who could do dreams. So they pull him out of prison, they clean him up, and they bring him into Pharaoh's presence. Again, Joseph gives the glory to God. Pharaoh tells him the dream, and Joseph provides the interpretation that God gave to him. There are going to be seven years of plenty to be followed by seven years of severe famine. What to do? Joseph suggests, well, we probably should start storing up food today against those seven years when the famine comes. And Pharaoh says, we need somebody to organize all of this. Joseph, you're the man. You do it. And Joseph went from the dungeon to the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. He's faithful to his charge. The storehouses are filled, and then the famine hits. And the famine is severe, so severe it goes all the way back up to Canaan where his father and brothers are, and they run out of food. And Jacob tells his sons, go down and buy us some food. But he holds back the last son, the sole remaining son of the favorite wife, Benjamin, and sends the ten brothers by Leah and the concubines down to Egypt. Being foreigners, they have to deal with uh, the, the foreign representative there, which ends up being Joseph as well, the number two guy. They have to go all the way there. Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. They think, of course, he's long dead. And he's going to speak to them through an interpreter so they can't pick. So he doesn't know they're pick he can pick their language as they talk among themselves. And he will hear some very gut-wrenching, emotional sidebar conversations, so much so that at one point he has to leave to weep. But he decides to set up a test. He wonders, have my brothers changed since they sold me into slavery? And the test is going to focus on eventually putting Benjamin in jeopardy and then seeing if they ditch him just like they ditched Joseph so many years before. So here's how the test works. First of all, he's going to accuse them of being spies. Then he's going to pump them for information about his father and his brother. And in the context of not believing them, he's going to demand that they're going to produce his brother as the evidence that they're telling the truth. He tells them, first of all, I'm going to keep nine of you hostage and only one is going to go back. But after a couple of days, he backs off of that and he keeps only Simeon hostage and the other brothers are sent back. But he tells them, no more food unless you prove the truth of your story by producing your brother, this so-called brother, Benjamin. And on the way out, he tells his steward, by the way, stick their money back in their grain sacks, and that's what he does. Then brothers go home. Open their sacks, there's their money, must have been a clerical error, and they eat the food. More time goes by, the food gets eaten, time to buy more food. Jacob tells his sons, go down, buy more food. They say, hey, we can't go, the man won't see us unless we produce Benjamin. Jacob says, I lose Benjamin, I'm a dead man. You already broke my heart when I lost Benjamin, when I lost Joseph. They had taken his coat and dipped it in animal's blood, and the story was probably tor torn into pieces by a wild animal. Finally, Jacob will relent. Judah goes up and says, I'll be the guarantee of the boy's safety. He says, if he dies, he dies. And they go down. Again, they meet with Joseph. Joseph, uh, he decides to tickle their jealousy a little bit. You know, he's going to seat them in the order in which they're born around the table, and he's going to give Benjamin, the favorite son of the favorite wife, five times as much goodies as the others. He's, he's working the scene. They have the meal. They do their business, and it's time for their brothers again to go home. 
Joseph again tells his steward, put the money back in the sack. But this time, take my, my silver cup. You can tell it, I use it for divination. I, I don't think, you know, commentators wonder, is, is he actually practicing his witchcraft? I don't think it's anything more than it's just part of the head game. I can even read your thoughts in this whole divination thing. But anyway, tell him I use it for divination, divination and stick it in the sack of the youngest brother. That's what he does. Brothers leave. Now, Joseph tells us, now go after them and accuse them of, accuse them of stealing the cup. Steward catches up with them. The brothers are outraged. They're at the accusation of being called a thief. And they take this rash vow. They say, in whosoever sack this is found, let him die. And we'll all be your servants so sure they have their own innocence. One by one, they unload their animals. One by one, they open the sacks all the way down to Benjamin. And there's the cup. And the moment of truth has just arrived. What will they do? Now, we know what they did years ago, right? Hey, bummer, Benjamin. Tough luck. I uh, hope it works out for you. we got to get back to Dad with the food. They would have ditched him. But the Spirit has been working in the brothers' hearts as well. And this is what Joseph has wanted to see. All the brothers load up their sacks, all of them load back up the animals. They all go back down to Egypt. And our text opens with them now on their face in the dirt before the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. Genesis 44, beginning at verse 14. This is the word of God. When Joseph and his brothers came to jo Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there. They fell before him to the ground, and Joseph said to them, what deed is this that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me can indeed practice divination? And Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear or justify ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also in whose hand the cup has been found. But Joseph said, Far be it from me that I should do so. Only the man in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. Then Judah went up to him and said, Oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ears. And let not your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a young brother, the child of his old age. His brother is dead. And he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, bring him down to me, that I might set my eyes on him. We said to my Lord, the boy cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Then you said to your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall not see my face again. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And when our father said, go again and buy us a little food, we said, we cannot go down. If our younger brother goes with us, then we will go down, for we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons. One left me, and I said, Surely he has been torn to pieces. I have never seen him since. If you take this one also from me, and harm happens to him, you will bring down my gray hairs in evil to Sheol. Now, therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then, as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now, therefore, Please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that will find my father. Then Joseph could not control him before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud. So the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. 
So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He's made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children, and your children's children, and your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt, and of all you have seen, hurry, hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your glorious word, for in it you reveal to us what we are to believe concerning you and what duties you require of us in response. In it, you tell us of Christ. You reveal him to us. Your spirit takes that word and works in our heart with it. And we ask this morning that your spirit would take that word, plow our hearts with it, that we might bear fruit to your glory and to your honor. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At the very center of Scripture stands Jesus Christ. It's all about him. From the very beginning in Genesis, as we look forward to that Redeemer who would come, it points to Jesus. We see God calling out for himself a covenant people that he will begin to train so that when the Messiah comes, they will recognize him. He will give them his teaching, his revelation. We see in the prophets as God segregates a kingdom for himself and then guides them time and time again, pointing them forward to Christ. In the Gospels, Christ, the years Christ is with us on the face of this earth are recorded. And then the acts of Christ through his church as the church began to get established. And then the letters to those churches, talking again, telling us what Christ did and how we are to live. And then finally the scripture ends with that wonderful book pointing us forward again to the return of Christ in power and in glory. But always it's about Christ. No matter where you open your Bible and begin reading, one of those questions you want to ask yourself is, what does this one teach us about Christ? This morning we'll look at our text. Three very simple points. Number one, sooner or later, our sins will find us out. Number two, to redeem his people from eternal condemnation, God himself will provide the perfect substitute to bear our punishment in full. And number three, Christ calls his people to draw near to him that they might have him for his sake alone. Sooner or later, our sins will find us out. God provides a substitute. Christ calls us to draw, draw near to himself. Sooner or later, our sins will find us out. I don't know what goes through your heart, but if you're anything like me, when you hear pastor read the Ten Commandments, what goes through your heart? I hear the first commandment, guilty. And the second commandment, guilty. 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 Every single one of them I have broken. All of us here have secret sins. Things we've done in our past that we're deeply ashamed of, that we pray never see the light of day. 
Those ones that when we can't sleep in the middle of the night and the evil one kind of sits on your shoulder and whispers, that one, that one is too bad, even for the blood of Christ. Probably no one here in this room has ever sold a kid brother into slavery. I mean, that one is pretty low when all is said and done. There, there's some terrible things out there. There may be some things worse, but that one in particular, I mean, it just breaches every bond in our familiar fa family fabric to sell your kid brother into slavery. The brothers who did this had to live with that all these years. In that first trip down to Egypt, Joseph overhears one of their sidebar conversations. It goes like this in Genesis 42. Then the brothers said to one another, Truly we are guilty concerning our brother, because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, and yet we would not listen. Therefore this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not tell you, do not sin against the boy? And you would not listen? Now comes the reckoning for his blood. Whether our secret sins ever see the light of day in this life, we know there is a day coming when everything will be exposed. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, Scripture says, so that each one may be received what is due for them, for they have done in their body, whether for good or sin. Psalmist will write in Psalm 90, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. And the Revelation talks about the day the books will be opened. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And then another book is opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what is written in the books, according to what they have done. Our brothers here are in their faces in the dirt. And Judah speaks out for his brothers in verse 16, and he says, What can we say to my Lord? What can we speak? How can we clear or justify ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. And right here, Judah has put his finger on the central question in all of Scripture. How can we justify ourselves? And brothers and sisters, the bad news this morning is we can't. There's nothing we can do, nothing we can say. There's no sacrifice we can make, not even giving up our lives in a very noble and worthy cause that can earn us one drop of saving merit when we stand before God on that day of judgment. Nothing. Scripture says no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. The evil one would have you believe that when you stand before God on the day of judgment, God's going to do one of these things. He's going to look and say, well, you did some good stuff, you did some bad stuff. And you're going to say, well, the, I did more good stuff than bad stuff. Yeah, I didn't kill anybody. Uh, I paid most of my taxes. I didn't cheat on my wife. Um, yeah, I was a pretty good guy when all is said and done. And besides, I'm a whole lot lighter, better than that guy over there. So, Lord, you know, you don't have to put me in the front row of heaven, but, but back row is fine by me. And if that's what you think is going to happen, because that's what the world would say is going to happen, you've just swallowed the big one. That is the lie, the grand lie, and that is the road to hell. 
If all of a sudden the police were to show up now and close us down, you will have just heard the most miserable, hopeless message you've ever heard in your life. Because there's no hope. And that's what we have to see. We have no hope in ourselves. Sooner or later, those sins are going to come out, they're going to be exposed, and we're going to be guilty, and we have no hope, because there's nothing we can do to justify ourselves. But the good news of the gospel is it doesn't end there. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that God will intervene, and God himself will provide that substitute. And look at our story. Verse 33, Judah goes up to Benjamin and offers to substitute for him. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as slave to my Lord and let the lad go up with his brothers. The Holy Spirit is working. Somehow Judah gets this idea that it might be possible for one to take the place of another and bear that other's punishment in full, that that one can go free, and this one suffers the punishment instead. Where did that come from? We know what it points to, don't we? God is beginning to prepare his people for the one who will come and bear our punishment in full. And this is already the second lesson in substitutionary atonement in Scripture. Remember the first one? God tells... uh, God tells Abraham to sacrifice the child of the promise, Isaac. They're headed off to the mountain. Isaac's carrying the wood. He's looking around saying, hey, Dad, where's the animal? The Lord will provide. They get up there, lay out Isaac on the altar. Abraham's ready to kill him. The Lord intervenes. He says, now I know. Take that ram in the thicket and sacrifice him in place of your son in place of. Judah and the brothers have also come to see the awfulness of their sin. It has consequences. None of them could have ever believed that their father would be a broken man when Joseph was supposedly killed. He never really recovered. He has one last son, and he talks about, you'll kill me if the boy doesn't come home. They've come to begin to understand their responsibilities as well. In this case, Judah made an explicit promise for the boy's safety, for Benjamin. But what brother isn't responsible for his kid brother? And they've come to see the consequences of their sin, and to abhor what they have done. We see hearts broken by sin, for Judah says, for how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. It's interesting that the brother who offers to be the substitute is Judah. Because from whose line will the real substitute come? It will be the line of Judah that the Christ will come. The psalmist will say, Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of his life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and not see the pit. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol for he will receive me. God himself in Christ will provide that substitute to take our place for our sin. And we see in this story, we see God ordering all things for the good of his people. He provides for them a substitute, but even on the lesser scale, just preserving their lives. And he has also worked his grace in the heart of Joseph as well. Rather than breathing vengeance and fire upon his brothers and wiping them out as he easily could have done with lifting one little finger, he instead sees God's overarching hand and providence in this. He acknowledges that. And he tells his brothers, Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sent me here, for God sent me 
before you to preserve life. And in this, Joseph is as foreshadowing Christ as well, the one who goes before to make a safe way for God's people. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. God has made me Lord of all Egypt, and there I will provide also for you. God is ordering all things for the good of his people. He provides that substitute. But the good news doesn't stop there. For we see God calls him his people to draw near to himself that they might have him for his sake alone. What do you do when you run into a relative or a friend you haven't seen in 10 or 20 years and you see him across the room? What do you do? You wave at him? You send him a text? No. You run over or they run to you and you go and you find a place to sit down right next to one another and if you were in Uganda you would hold hands. Oh, we're not in Uganda, you still sit next to one another. And you share what's going on in your life. You want to be with them, right there. Nothing else really does it. Certainly email doesn't do it. You want to be with them in person. Despite the stench of our sins, Christ freely offered himself to be that perfect substitute to redeem us from eternal condemnation. On the cross, he took the full punishment for our sins, and we receive the benefit of all that Christ accomplished by faith and faith alone. We have no grounds for self-justification, nothing we can point to. To answer Judah's question, we cannot justify ourselves. But look at the marvelous gospel invitation. Joseph says to his brothers, come near to me, please. He says to his father Jacob, come down to me and do not delay, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children. Well, brothers and sisters, Christ says to his family, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Earlier we read from his high priestly prayer, Father, I desire that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, in order that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You know what's one of the most amazing things about the gospel that I can't quite get my head around? Christ wants me to be with him. I know my heart. I know there's nothing attractive in there. And yet, for reasons I cannot fathom, there's nothing that would commend me. Christ wants me. Christ wants you, his people. He actually wants us to be with him. And that one I can't fully understand but I delight in it because that's the promise in God's word. When you share the gospel with unbelieving associates, students, friends, neighbors, whatever, and, you know, you range across a number of topics, but you eventually get around to talking about heaven. You know, you ask, well, do you want to go to heaven? And in all my years, I've never heard anybody say, no, I don't want to go to heaven. But then you ask them, Why? Why do you want to go to heaven? And for the Christian, there's only one answer, right? Why do you want to go to heaven? I hear it. Why do you want to go to heaven? Because Jesus is there, and I want to be with Jesus, and he wants me to be with him. That's why I want to go to heaven. If Jesus isn't in heaven, I don't want to be there either, because I want to be with Jesus. In this life, how do we draw near to Christ as he calls us to draw near to him? Well, he gives us the means of grace. He gives us his word, especially the preaching of it. He gives us prayer that we might pour out the desires of our hearts to him according to his will. 
He gives us the sacraments, especially his supper, where he meets with us by faith around his table and with tangible things confirms to us this is real. You can count on my promises. I am making a place for you. And on that day of judgment, when the books are opened and you are there helpless, I'll be there too. And I'll claim you for me. This one is mine. I died for him. I died for her. I want them to be with me. They are mine. And that is what we look forward to on that great day of judgment. But oh, how we look forward even more to seeing him face to face. We walk by faith in this life, but that faith will one day be sight, and we will see our blessed Savior, together with all of our brothers and sisters from around the world and across the ages, forever. And I heard a voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Then Joseph fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept on them. And afterward, his brothers talked with him. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, that wonderful good news that in Christ our sins are forgiven because he took them himself. In Christ we have a heavenly Father to whom we can go, knowing that you have loved us with an everlasting love knowing that you are ordering all things for the good of your people, knowing that even this day our Savior is preparing a place for us and that one day he will come again and receive us to himself, that we might be with him face to face in glory forever. We thank you, O Lord, for your church. We thank you for these brothers and sisters in Christ that you give to us, that in your perfect order you have ordained that we would be pursuing our pilgrimages at the same time on this earth. May we encourage one another. May we help one another along the way. May we bear one another's burdens. And Lord, we think of all of those who have yet to hear of Christ, those who are still in bondage to their sin, in mortal fear of death, well, Lord, we pray that you would send many forth to proclaim this good news that your people might be gathered in, that Jesus Christ might be praised. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing hymn number 542. 542, let us stand until we sing.
grace, mercy, and peace rest upon you. And may the Holy Trinity card you and keep you throughout this day and throughout this coming life. Bless us, we pray, most mighty God, and receive his blessing yourselves. Amen. Amen. Amen.